Good morning, everyone. Just about ready to get started. So, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Philippe Bourgeois, Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Center for Social Medicine and Humanities here at the South Institute and the Department of Psychiatry at the David Devon School of Medicine in UCLA. Philippe came here to UCLA from the University of Pennsylvania, and before that, he was the founding chair of the Department of Anthropology, History, and Social Medicine at UCSF, a prominent a proponent of a public anthropology that brings rigorous qualitative methods and critical social science theory to bear on urgent social problems. Philippe was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2018. He has conducted long-term participant observational fieldwork in the U.S. and city on social inequality, poverty, violence, incarceration, inner city segregation, labor migration, homelessness, substance use disorder, labor migration, the global narcotics industry, mental health, and HIV AIDS. He has published over a dozen books, edited volumes, special issues of journals, and well over 150 different journal articles. His two best known books are In Search of Respect, Selling Crack, and El Barrio, and Righteous Dopeen. Other volumes include The Miss the Work, Divided Labor on the Central American Vienna Plantation, Violence in the War and Peace, and Violence at the Urban Margins. He is currently co authoring a book on the carceral and psychiatric dismanagement of inner city poverty entitled Corner with uh, University of Princeton Press, and his talk today is particularly timely as the LA Board of Supervisors is discussing whether to build a new medical jail to replace Twin Towers. His talk today is titled, The Contradictions Between Clinical and Law Enforcement Priorities on the Front Lines of Serious Mental Illness Care in Los Angeles County. Welcome. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Philippe. very much. And, uh, uh, it's it's a pleasure and an honor to be presenting today. You can, I hope most of you are psychiatrists because you can see clearly how how much I care about this and how nervous I was. I managed to my PowerPoint managed to give everyone Marfan syndrome, and I managed to forget the first page of the talk. But you can also see this talk. I'm, I'm not a, a a real doctor, as I say. I'm not a clinician. I'm an anthropologist. Um, and I direct this, um, uh, and the, um, in, in, in we see the instant um, cultural, um, the, the, the epistemological difficulties of communicating across disciplines. In anthropology, it's rude to not read every single word of your talk on a piece of paper. In, in medicine, you look like a kook when you do that. So I'll try to go a little bit back and forth, but every single word is written out because I, uh, wanted each word to be important in some sense, so I apologize for that. Um, so, um, unfortunately, um, this is a collaboration between um, uh, the, with the um, LA County Department of Mental Health's uh, uh, new uh, assisted uh, outpatient treatment program, which began in late 2015. And we, um, my co-author, my primary co-author, Joel Braslau, who's unfortunately out of the country and can't be here, who is a real psychiatrist, also a real PhD historian, um, is the PI on a quality improvement evaluation contract with DMH to, uh, to examine how this pilot program, uh, uh, which is actually the largest in the country of its kinds of uh, AOT programs. So you'll, the AOT programs, for those that aren't instantly familiar with them, are basically various types of versions of ACT programs on steroids. They are street <laughs> outreach programs to try to, uh, or at least the, a, the LA interpretation of it is, to, to try to do urgent outreach with people in states of crisis and vulnerability. So, um, the, uh, and, and I'll be presenting, um, at, in the, the, the data that I'll be presenting is, it is somewhat depressing on outcomes and processes. So I want to emphasize right from the beginning how much awe I have in, in, with the people who are on the front lines actually addressing this issue as clinicians, as social service providers uh, who are being thwarted in a sense, and this is the argument of my talk, by a set of structural forces that are way beyond the agency of any, of any single set of individuals, but that we, we need to understand if we're ever going to make the situation better 
and break the tragic cycles of uh, homelessness, incarceration, emergency, hospitalization, uh, over and over and over that is affecting. In Los Angeles, it's just more visible. Um, and um, uh, it, it's just more visible than in other countries because of our size. Let me, uh, you told me that would do this. It'd be a lot of that. Yeah, that's better. Um, and, um, and uh, you know. So, um, I've been doing street-based um, participant observation research for the past 25 years in the United States, yeah, primarily in, in inner cities, primarily among open-air drug sellers and homeless people with substance use disorders, starting in Puerto Rican East Harlem at the height of the crack epidemic, that was a shop in the crack house that I wrote about, um, in, the, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when U.S. murder rates shot up to historic highs. Then under the downtown freeways of rapidly gentrifying San Francisco, and then in the Puerto Rican inner city of Philadelphia, a city with one of the most brutal, corrupt, and violent police, police forces in the United States. LA cops and sheriffs are angels compared to the cops. Um, uh, but, and this is, um, and I say this honestly, I've never seen such a con concentrated level of sheer, raw, genuine human vulnerability as we see every single day in Los Angeles streets, if we open our eyes on the way to the park. Um, and, and literally masses of individuals with serious mental illness can be seen frantically or despondently wandering our streets and highway underpasses, too often in Florida decompensation or urgent visible distress that when you stop and think about it, just a normal person in, in, in a normal society wouldn't walk by them, let alone a clinician who's trained to deal with them, to glorify them. And it's not your fault or our fault. This is, a, a, I think, a, a historical level tragedy uh, in terms of how the United States deals with its, on some level, structurally most vulnerable set of dependent populations um, and uh, who need um, uh, structured care. So, um, in, um, it, it, an estimated 53,000 people are homeless in Los Angeles. With, some 27% of them being seriously mentally ill, mostly with schizophrenia spectrum or bipolar diagnoses. They're, they're, they're pursued, though, not just by their illness, but also by the police and by methamphetamine sellers, and equally brutally, and this is what's somewhat harder to see, uh, uh, it, it, by the um, invisible forces of rising housing costs and neighborhood gentrification. Um, in a nutshell, I'll be presenting the everyday interactional effects of the structural systems level disparities in health for people with serious mental illness, caused by what I'm arguing are identifiable social structural forces, such as, and this is the elephant in, in, in I think, all discussions of US policy, where we've sunk the most historically outrageous amount of resources. And the only way to see it on some level is on the macro level seven-fold increase in, in the number of people incarcerated in the United States uh, since the, the late 1970s. And if you stop and think about it, it isn't just that the United States has the most people behind bars, both in absolute numbers and proportionally. There's never in history been this many people locked up um, uh, by, by any kind of central authority, just from 1970 to the, to, to the present, the, the modelers uh, claim. So um, the so uh, that uh, so and and what what, what uh, of course what this gets called in the popular language is the word you're, you're familiar with uh, probably mass incarceration. In fact, that's not a technically accurate term from a social science uh, more rigorous perspective. It's actually um, a hyper incarceration when you look at it closely because it targets very specific people along racialized and class lines. So um, um, the disparities between African Americans, Latinos, um, um, uh, uh, Native Americans, and um, between men and women, and between rich and poor in our in, in our jails are, are are astounding and clear. There's few that that are that are that powerful. Um, and um, the Bureau of Justice uh, Statistics actually keeps um, uh, uh, reasonably good statistics about this, and, in their, in, and they estimate 
of based on uh, um, the, the last survey was 233 state and federal prisons and 358 jails, that jail inmates have five times higher rates of serious psychological distress, that's the term they use, uh, than the standardized general U.S. population, which uh, uh, can be estimated at 26% in, in jails, you know, very roughly, and 5% um, in the general population, very roughly. And what's, what's interesting in terms of hyperincarceration uh, in such a racialized ways, whites are normally tremendously underrepresented in prisons and jails. It's a simple product of how uh, structural forces and the, and the administrative um, uh, bureaucracies interfacing with racist ideologies end up um, funneling people into a repressive solution as opposed to um, a supportive or a therapeutic or a rehabilitative one. But uh, in the case of uh, whites in jail, whites are dramatically overrepresented when they have serious mental illness. So whites with white males and, and even more white women with serious mental illness are especially high, highly uh, hyper incarcerated. Um, and um, and, and the, um, what, what this manifests here close to home is that there's, in, in, in very recent, you know, in our current conjuncture, is that since 2009, when California has been in a, in a, in a really wonderful, explicit recalibration of its hyper-carceral state, where very, there, there's a genuine political will among politicians, even among voters, we voted, you know, a, a, you know a, a, a whole set of propositions that would increase dramatically housing for people with serious mental illness. So, there, so we want to do the right thing. And that started in 2009. Finally, the, the curve started going down that you, that you saw in that previous graph. And California is one of the states leading the way in that recalibration. Tragically, we forget that California led the hyper-incarceration. We had the fastest growing rates of incarceration uh, in the 1980s and 1990s of any um, uh, system. And we were the ones that pioneered through strikes you're out all that whole model for zero tolerance policing, which led to such irrational mandatory minimums that were so appealing to politicians and so appealing on a populist level all across the country um, and have put us in this, in this quandary, expensive quandary. So, um, so even at this great moment where we're, we're in some sense on paper doing everything right, we had a doubling of the number of people in the county jail uh, that, who have serious mental illness um, uh, in, in, since 2009, which was the year of recalibration. So um, it's, it's, it needs to be understood, as, as I'm arguing, as a cascade of systems levels effects combining structural forces like gentrification of property values and specific policies and social movements, which are, which are more cultural, ideological um, um, uh, dimensions, like, and this is a super important one because our hospital is named after him, like Ronald Reagan's populist taxpayers' revolt that propelled neoliberalism nationally, slashing public subsidies for services, affordable housing, followed by, um, also under him, a revving up of the irrational U.S. war on drugs and specifically framed around the zero-tolerance policing practices that are exacerbated by, in the California case, in particular dysfunction that we have, uh, of outrageously lengthening sentences and, um, and specifically it's our actual probation system that we can technically throw people back in jail. We have one of the highest recidivism rates um, uh, for that reason. But that's all hopefully changing, although there was an article yesterday in the, in the paper saying it isn't. But that, is, that wants to be changed by our system. Okay, so um, the, um, uh, so, uh, so we, we also have to recognize the larger historical context, and this is the influence of my uh, primary uh, co-author, um, Joel, is always bringing us back to history so we don't have to relive uh, all the idiocies that we keep doing to ourselves, or at least learn from them. And, uh, um, we have to recognize that in the larger historical context of the well-intended but disastrously neoliberal implemented deinstitutionalization of state hospitals that occurred without a pair expansion of community-based supportive housing and social services, and above all, um, uh, affordable housing. And it's really heartbreaking if you look back 
which we often don't do in medicine. If you look back at what the psychiatrists were saying, it's saying in the late 1970s and the 1980s, it's very moving. They're, they're setting up this alarm cry saying, you know, this is a disaster. There's a whole new set, a new profile of people coming into county jails. It's the police that are seeing, uh, that are seeing our, the patients that we used to see first, and they're the ones making the decisions on, on where to take people, and they're taking them to, to jail instead of, uh, instead of to our hospitals. Um, so now, though, what, what we often think uh, when we're frustrated in, in, in practices and in policy making on the front lines is that this, um, uh, in this California version of LPS laws, um, we start blaming them for the tragedies of homelessness, incarceration, and substance use disorder. Um, but in fact, this historical graph um, uh, suggests the introduction of LPS laws did not linearly affect the slope of the deinstitutionalization curve. Um, that was the structural force that was occurring in that sense. Um, lack, of, uh, lack of subsidized housing, fragmented social service and predatory, for-profit clinical corporate logics, distorts, distort clinical practice in publicly funded psychiatric emergency rooms. Um, and, um, and, and those forces have been more important than a magic bullet of changes in grave disability or civil conservation laws. Um, this first field note then that I'm going to finally give to you describes a spontaneous comment by the thoughtful, progressive, but very overwhelmed head of one of LA County's very few remaining publicly funded emergency psychiatric rooms before um, we gave a grant, a grant a version of this grand rounds. Um, um, and, um, and this particular county ER evaluates and treats approximately 5,000 patients per year. So it has a, a, it's a big impact uh, in our city. And he explained in genuine frustration, quote, for the last three months, over 70% of our beds have been filled with, nearly con with newly conserved, this is a, 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 a web shot from Twin Towers uh, web. Um, with, with newly conserved patients simply waiting for beds uh, in IMDs or state hospitals, and none are available. We can't do anything about it because most of the conserved patients come directly from the county jail's MIST program. By the way, the MIST program is one of those absolutely fantastic programs of, 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 of uh, recalibration, which is designed completely commonsensically to get people with misdemeanors out of the jail environment into community-based um, um, uh, treatment facilities um, out of Twin Towers. And it actually works. Um, it's, it's, it's getting people out so fast that it's now filled up what, what is supposed to be dealing with the emergency needs of, of, of neighborhoods to keep someone from killing themselves, stabilizing them, and so forth for, for, for evaluation and triage for more resources. Um, so um, it, so uh, he goes, we only have 15 inpatient beds left for our own referrals. Um, in fact, it has gotten so bad, he adds, that for the past two weeks, they have not been able to admit a single one of their own patients. Um, um, and he adds that their star former um, boarding jail patient had occupied his bed for 420 days because no state hospital or IMD beds um, were willing to take him. Uh, he, he refers to it as cherry picking, explaining that IMDs are privately run, giving them the right to refuse patients whose profiles do not meet their licensing requirements. Um, and this, this privatization autonomy further reduces, obviously, than long-term services available to the city's most vulnerable uh, patients, precisely the ones that uh, will be getting arrested, will be homeless, and that no one wants to take care of. So I, I want to flag that, um, that obstacle to accessing care caused by that uh, very specific um, neoliberal policy, sort of the definition of it, of, of a shift to public-private partnerships in tandem with rising with our rising cultural ideological distrust of, um, of, of big government, uh, something pretty essentially um, American. Unfortunately, this dedicated but frustrated head psychiatrist did take unilateral action the next week, uh, uh, we learned. Um, uh, he suddenly stopped accepting conserved patients referred by the LA County Jail's terrific risk for the release program that I was just describing. Um, and, um, and so consequently, LA County then 
uh, starting, uh, that was about um, three months ago, um, uh, went through a period, and, and LA County has a population, just to remind you, of 10 million people sprawling over 4,700 square miles, but only three publicly funded site ER facilities. And the jail uh, uh, then all of a sudden only had two facilities left to rotate the burden of their referrals of, 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 of urgently concerning inmate patients. Um, now, actually, I just learned last night from our, our collaborator uh, in, 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 uh, in Twin Towers that he has reopened uh, the ER. So that, that there, there, there is agency in some sense on that kind of a level. Um, so then, so, so there, there's now a possibility of getting more people. Um, into more appropriate facilities for treatment. Um, so um, now macro, macro statistics confirm um, a dramatical logistical and legal subordination, and, and this is really the core of the argument that, 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 that might be, that, that I think is crucial. Uh, it, it, uh, a subordination of therapeutic to criminal justice mandates inside our hospitals. And you see it with, with these slides, in where the orange line represents for, uh, forensic commitments in, in, the, in the few remaining public um, psychiatric um, hospitals. These are the, the long-term hospitals. Um, and the blue line are the civilly conserved, uh, conserved ones. And the, the forensic arm of the state, so, so, so to speak, has crowded out um, the, um, the, uh, the therapeutic arm. So my next um, uh, ethnographic extract is from a visit with the UCLA psychiatry residents to the forensic unit of the LA County Jail. And I want to um, tell you about, just as an aside, a very exciting program that, um, that because of our collaborators in Twin Towers, we, we've been able to develop a rotation for our psychiatry residents uh, in their third and fourth years through Twin Towers. Um, and and uh, the idea being to uh, to channel to channel um, the, the quality of our residents into be, being on the front lines of solving this problem where it is most difficult. Um, and um, so um, and, and remember, this this is the jail, a jail. Our jail locks up between four thousand and five thousand individuals with serious mental illness. There's about um, eighteen to nineteen thousand uh, in all, um, and many of them. Um, end up in de facto solitary confinement cells with some uh, on any given day floridly decompensating. Uh, so the note, the nursing supervisor has worked in this forensic inpatient unit since 1998 and is thrilled with the UCLA residents um, uh, coming to visit. The facility has built, was built, he says, for only 45 patients. Um, and he, and he um, complains that the waiting list has been, always been, quote, very, very long. But we do well here. But then he adds, no one should be here. It's not therapeutic, uh, uh, quote. And then he announces with more pride, but today is historic. It is our first ever 30th day of no restraints. When he started working here in 1998, he says, at least 30 inmates were in restraints on any given day. I ask if they have to raise staffing levels to accomplish this. No, we just can't come together, gather around the patient until it calms down. It takes lots of attention, but we know how to do it. We're good at it. DOJ will be happy. Now, DOJ, if you're not familiar with getting sued, is a reference to the two federal class action settlement decrees against the LA County Jail for mental illness and medical maltreatment, essentially. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and also um, uh, more mundane things, uh, tragic things like the use of force and petty corruption by sheriffs. I do want to note is that we're, it, 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 we're so protective and out of touch with reality uh, in, in medicine. You can't even imagine what, what it, and this is all public record, but for some reason it remains invisible to us. You can find all of it in, 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 you know, in easily accessible files on the internet. They, they actually, they, they, a gang within, of sheriffs within the county jail was tattooing on the skulls of their, of their patients. Their gang insignia, but they have tattooed on their bodies. I mean, they were, it's like, how does that happen? They were doing that in the emergency facilities of the jail when people were sedated um, and somehow had managed to get rid of the clinicians and do this. Um, and, and we only know that because they caught them and, 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 and and sanctioned them and then rehabilitated them and so forth. But um, so, 
Um, it's, 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 so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a level that's hard to conceive in some sense, unless you um, actually take the time to um, hang out after hours in these settings and so forth. Um, so um, then, oh, I'm sorry, I'll continue with the note. But, um, okay, uh, suddenly right behind us, an elderly woman's voice blocked by a makeshift canvas stand to block visibility in or out of her cell startles us. She is repeating over and over, I have been kidnapped. Please notify the authorities. I have been kidnapped. Please. I bend down and see her frail form squatting awkwardly to project her voice out from below the canvas. Um, further down the hallway, from another cell, also blocked by Ken's canvas, a hoarser male voice rasps in distressed rage. I'm a victim of abuse. Help me, help me. I'm a victim of abuse. Look at me. Covered in diarrhea all over. And they won't clean me. I'm a victim of abuse. He too shouts this repeatedly, while also squatting to catch a glimpse of us. As we walk further down the hall hallway, another male inmate calls out, calls out um, directly to me. Please, please, sir. I need a lawyer. I need a lawyer. The judge didn't let me talk. Get me a lawyer. Get me a lawyer. Get me a lawyer. Help me. Help me. Um, returning then to the macro epidemiological picture, the cascade of structural political economic forces that is besetting people with serious mental illness it, and, and funneling them into, into settings like this instead of into hospitals or community-based services has, has, has measurable de de dead mistakes, I would argue. Mortality disparity ratios for individuals with schizophrenia specifically, this is what this, this slide is showing, have more than doubled since the 1970s, according to multiple um, um, meta-analyses. AOT programs legally impose, as I was saying, mandatory, or I wasn't quite saying it to you clearly, but mandatory outpatient care for treatment disengaged individuals refusing services. But in California, the service providers delivering the treatment mandated by our tax, our, our tax dollars on this, um, have, have to, by law, be private sector providers, not, they're not allowed to be public sector providers for specifically the AOT problem. Another one of those just classic um, um, irrationalities to get public support or just corrupt lobbying by whoever managed to get that into the law um, to force public you know, to, to give um, uh, less priority to pure therapeutic um, clinical priorities. Um, and in this case, it's just a, it's just a simple for profit uh, uh, priority. Um, but. Um, uh, and, 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 and it was what you were hearing from the head of the psychiatric ER in terms of his frustration with the INDs. And furthermore, and this is, this is a, a, an extraordinary double bind, in classic California civil liberties non sequitur, private providers often insist that they, and, and, and completely right, righteously, and you'll see that the sheriffs and police also tell this to us, that they are forbidden by law from imposing involuntary care um, despite AOT by law being um, a, a, a mandatory program for care. Um, but patients um, in AOT um, and, 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 and cannot be medicated without you know, a due process, without a separate use court hearing. Um, so, that they're, 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 so now, and what we see in terms of the emerging administrative statistics, that some 62% uh, of the 1,852 individuals referred to L referred to LA's program um, between May 15, 2015 and December 15, 2018, for the United Nations for Statistics, um, were homeless with histories of incarceration. Sadly, however, you see that um, some 55% of those who qualified for services um, um, fell through the cracks before they were, before being referred to private providers. So that's the 45% 60% met criteria, but only 45% actually enrolled in services. Um, and, of, of, and of those that then uh, did make it in to uh, get it, receiving services, um, uh, less than 60% um, uh, of them were discharged prematurely. And what that means, there's some ambiguity in that term in terms of the administrative statistics, that means that many of them, if not most of them are falling back into the crack of revolving door of the revolving door of homelessness, substance use disorder, psychiatric ERs, and county jails. Now, to document these, the reason for this um, intense 
ethnographic component on this evaluation called an improvement contract was to give greater granularity to these uh, administrative statistics. And our ethnographers have been shadowing the very dedicated LA County Department of Mental Health outreach and engagement providers who, chase, who literally chase after people on the street, through parking lots, inside jails, uh, and in, in, in behind houses, in, in garages, uh, where, um, where, um, um, where, where a mother might have, have, have uh, put the son, or they're not deceivers, so I won't, I'll go into that. Um, more than nine public agencies. Okay, well, these logistics of, of following the AOT engagement outreachers give us a strategic bird's eye view of, the, of, the, of how the fragmentation of the public safety net um, uh, operates. Um, and in LA County, we, we, it, you know, roughly we can say that more than nine public uh, agencies um, are, are, are absolutely essential to this public safety net. But there are hundreds of smaller additional um, um, uh, non-profit um, and, and, and sometimes for-profit agencies who deliver services within this public safety net. Virtually none of these dozens of, 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 of agencies and more than dozens of private um, and, um, agencies have synchronized data collection systems. Many cannot synchronize files even across departments within their own agency. Many routine with the exact same vulnerable individual without knowledge of one another, sometimes directly contradicting each other's medications and program goals, all at great expense. Um, and we don't have, by definition, we don't have good numbers on this because there are, our, our data systems aren't able to measure. Um, and this is the project that we're currently working on, a synchronization of the data systems. Um, um, in short, um, uh, neoliberal, oh, this is the yeah, and neoliberally administered public-private partnerships exacerbate fragmentation, decreasing accountability within the safety net, even as the aggregate number of services morph into multi-million, if not billion-dollar special interest constituencies, including some notably rapacious for-profit multinational corporations. Um, uh, in the LA AOT program alone, there are 23 different private full-service treatment provider deliverers of private services. A few are excellent, but outreach providers informally consider um, many, um, if not most, to be more or less incompetent or hostile, with, of course, exceptional individual superheroes uh, who, who last through the, the, the front lines. And, and, and this can be measured to some extent structurally. The biggest single problem is simply the stupid thing of, of, of excessive staff rotation, because the people on the front lines are, are so burned out by this task that they can't provide the services that they've been hired to do, that they, that they quit and they, they, they shift and they get promoted. Um, so despite um, the AOT program's good intentions, coercive law enforcement um, um, uh, um, fills the, value, the, the vacuum of the fragmentation of services. Um, and as a result, um, uh, coercive outcomes do not seem to be decreasing. These numbers um, are, are probably gross um, underestimates that, that I'm showing right here uh, because of the missing data uh, in the administrative system, but they did, do give you some sense. Our ethnographic data suggests, um, and, and, and this is what we need to um, um, uh, uh, synchronize with, with, um, with, with, with better macro numbers, um, that law enforcement officers who used to ignore and avoid interactions with people with serious mental illness, now believe that there is a new coherent, well-funded program with good therapeutic and housing integrated services uh, uh, for, for, for people with serious mental illness. So they now sometimes arrest them uh, to force them to adhere to a program from which uh, most of the participants, as we see, seem to be falling through the cracks. Public defenders and judges in, in the um, LA Mental Health Court, which is really an extraordinary facility, one of, the, one of the oldest um, and, and, and largest in the country because of the magnitude of our problem, with super, super dedicated um, uh, judges um, uh, the, and, and public defenders, because it's a self-selected crowd who want to work with vulnerable populations. Um, they tell us that in the past, um, they, that, that they now enforce misdemeanor charges that they did not often enforce in the past. 
and they enforce them now to incentivize individuals with SMI, serious mental illness, to adhere to the multiple new LA County Mental Health Criminal, criminal Mental Health and Criminal Justice Partnership initiatives, uh, which again, to remind you, are primarily things like the AOT program, the MIST program, and the penalty of services run by the Office of Diversion and Reentry um, of the Department of Health Services. And the single biggest service charge, uh, um, services challenges, <clears throat> appears to be LA's uh, skyrocketing real estate market um, that any new hire is very familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, housing, or any uh, chair of the department is familiar with, I'm going to include some. Mm -hmm. More debatable is the friction caused by a primary focus on adherence to medication rather than remediating the profound social isolation of clients. And what we see when, uh, when, when we're with the clients on the street is they alternatively reduce their social isolation by taking refuge in a very tragically welcoming community to them, a destructive community that um, likes to see them. Um, it's the open air methamphetamine markets of Skid Row Corners, often administered by local street gangs who owe allegiance to our state's infamous prison gangs. And, and, and this is just an aside, but you can see how the cascade of social forces that are unintended consequences operates. What's incredible about you know, all this Hollywood crips, bloods, and so forth, is that it's because of hyper-incarceration that LA became the gang capital, not just of the United States. All of Central America has been destroyed by LA's hyper-incarceration. Because when you're undocumented, you get deported to Central America, they now have the same gang names spelled in English, the same signs on their building walls uh, as we as as they as they learn to um, to to put on the on, on their streets here in LA. So it's a collateral damage of this massive, insane um, that, that, that red graph you saw uh, throwing the people in jail. So um, the um, now returning then um, more calmly. Uh, to the 100% increase in incarceration rates among people with serious mental illness in, re in recent years. Despite then, as I've been saying, the deployment of multiple good and well-intentioned new public diversion from incarceration programs. Um, and, um, and, and here, um, the, the public institutions that when, when we step back to see why maybe um, rehabilitative priorities have been subordinated to security and repressive criminal justice priorities. We see that the uh, public institutions that have most consistently had their budgets expanded rather than cut back since the 1980s are associated with criminal justice, sp specifically most uh, carceral facilities and, and also police and service agencies. Meanwhile, social service and treatment and housing institutions have atrophied or, or, um, or, or uh, yeah, uh, uh, with, with some um, diversity there. As a result, under California's so-called recalibration of hyperincarceration, when therapeutic services are purposefully enmeshed with criminal justice, it is quite logically the stronger, well-toned muscle of expanded jail, police, and sheriff personnel forces that dominate the so-called partnerships. They, 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 they operate 24-7, um, it, it, it doesn't slow down. They're always welcoming new people into their jail, and they don't ask permission and, and, and to, to bring them in or anything like that. Um, so, um, and, I, and I'll um, then rush through three ethnographic cases, the cases to show you how the details of that interface work um, among uh, super dedicated AOT outreach work. And these two notes were done by Blake Ed Erickson, one of our MD PhD graduate students. Uh, um, uh, she just applied for a psychiatry residency um, uh, a, uh, on our ethnographic team, who accompanied AOT outreach workers as they attempted to enforce a 5346 court order by a mental health court judge. This particular client, however, had already just been unsuccessfully 5150 the week before by these same AOT providers for smashing out the windows of his mother's house and shooting his BB gun up in the air while cursing racist epithets at his neighbors and running around naked. The nearest local uh, uh, community hospital, unfortunately, is not public and refused to complete his 5150, 72-hour hold. Instead, the hospital released him early without notifying uh, uh, the AOT providers. Uh, uh, apparently, they were um, 
carefully avoiding having any potential liability for having to house the patient, um, waiting for a, a longer term secure bed if they didn't conserve it. Desperately, the mother of the rejected patient placed a restraining order on her son, but like any normal loving parent, was having trouble enforcing that order. So now her son was living on her porch, intermittently cursing and threatening to punch her. Now, you may not be familiar with what the LA Mental Health Court calls the 5346 court order. I hope you're not. A uh, few people are, and it's hard to comprehend, but it's, uh, but it's a classic criminal justice uh, therapeutic mesh um, that um, it doesn't function for either one of the people participating in it. Um, basically, what it does in practical terms is it transfers the cost of transporting a complicated, difficult patient to the court so that they can be evaluated by a psychiatrist inside the court or, uh, and, and the mental health court doesn't want to have to pay for that, doesn't want to have to have the, do, deal with the logistics of, of housing um, and, and transporting and watching over people until the court session is. But hospitals are legally obliged to bring their patients who they've, who they've got on some of the two hold, hour holds into the court, um, into the court session. Um, so it's, it's that little mini dysfunction there that, um, that developed this, this new mechanism, uh, you know, which is basically similar to a 5150. Now, unfortunately, um, in this case, um, according to Blake's ethnographic note, two patrol cars and local police officers arrived before uh, the special police trained mental health um, uh, NET ambulance. And that's another one of the great programs that's a partnership between criminal justice and, and mental health. But that program, um, as you'll see here, is even more subordinated to criminal justice priorities than all the others. As a matter of fact, I didn't have time to put this note in. We actually had our ethnographers get trained as, as mental health um, police officers. Um, and, um, and, and, and one of the things that they're told constantly is that when it, your absolute priority is not getting shot, and they actually have a visualization of shooting at someone with, with mental illness as part of the de-escalation training. Um, and so you can go figure what, how that works on, 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 in, in practice. Okay, so. The sergeant leading the untrained officers is straightforward, rightfully furious at the uselessness of his previous cooperation just the week before with the AFT outreach workers. Well, we were, we were just out here last week and had to forcibly detain this same guy and place him on the hold. We did it with your team. This mom calls 911 all the time. We come out here all the time. This mom, um, um, how many times are you going to ask us to do these holds over and over? If it made no difference last week, why are we, you asking us to send him to the hospital again today? Meanwhile, the AOT client runs into the mother's house, throws her out the door, and slams the door, locking it shut. The sergeant, who claims he didn't see the mother being thrown out of her, out of her house, um, insists, no, now we can't risk an officer injury for something like this. Opening a locked door, even if the mom has the keys, risking officer injury, possibly having the guy come at us with a weapon, and the risk of us having to shoot him for coming at an officer, we can't have that. It would be all over the news, and we don't want uh, any more fake news. The AOT provider begs him to reconsider, but the engaged sergeant starts threatening the mother for violating her own restraining order and being, uh, he has a little pop psychology, being a codependent. Uh, he throws the court order onto the ground. The police officer, the police mental health team ambulance arrives at this time, and its officers, um, in contrast to the untrained officers, are in fact eager to go into the house hands-on. They know what the, what the 5346 is about and how it's different from the 5150. Um, and, um, and, and they see the mother standing by in tears with keys to the locked door, begging them to go. Uh, but the sergeant actually forbids them. But he does it gently, opportunistically invoking civil liberties and appealing to their personal security and their laziness and pride in their police officer autonomy. Quote, listen, we all go home safe if we don't get involved here. We work for the community, not for DMH. And that judge's paper, these AOT guys have, don't mean nothing to us. That thing doesn't give us no permission to violate the Fourth Amendment and break and enter someone's home. Um, the mental health team officers, the trained ones, reluctantly obey. But one of them kindly takes the AOT outreacher aside and apologizes. 
call us first next time when you do one of these 5346 things, and we'll try to use our influence. My perspective is that with Mom here opening the door for us, we could go in. But the sheriff here has blocked this from going forward today, and he's not going to let it happen on his watch. Honestly, if you wait until 4 p.m. and both the sergeant and the watch commander are off, if they don't pass on word to the next shift, you might have better luck. You might just be able to get your guy into the hospital. But when the officer sees that this is just making the AOT social worker angrier and angrier, he suddenly reverts back to his institutional allegiance. And in an almost non sequitur shift, begins making excuses for rather than critiquing his hostile sergeant. He also opportunistically evokes, yet again, the specter of the police being victims of draconian civil rights laws and bureaucracy. Both. I mean, you've got to understand, use of force requires so much paperwork. And there are a bunch of issues now in the 5150s of the Americans with Disabilities Act now. A lot of these mental health patients qualify as disabled. If we go hands-on with them and something goes wrong, we just get matched in court. Um, so I'll, I'll, for time, I'll skip the next note, which is um, a, a sheriff uh, doing essentially the same thing. And, and his quote is, I'll just read his quote. It's basically the same, very similar. If I go hands-on with this woman, and she's in Florida um, in compensation, civilians might video. And if she, if she came up at me, I mean, punches me, I'd have to fight her. If she runs into the house, streets, and, and we chase, and a truck hits her, we go to court. They blame it on me, I'm at fault. Then I'm in trouble. I got a kid. I don't want to do something crazy and get fired and lose my family. So, um, and uh, just to summarize, uh, a, a, a mental health court, the mental, one of the mental health court judges who saw all his, uh, many of his um, decrees not being enforced by the police officers, actually convened rationally a dialogue between the partners, between the sheriff's department oh, yeah. and, 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 the D, and DMH uh, to address this, this failure of cooperation on the streets. Um, and, and there, um, the AOT providers uh, proposed that the judge uh, put in that um, the, uh, the, the, the wording like um, uh, the, the, pr pr that the wording be mandatory as opposed to um, let's see the exact wording. Well, anyhow, the, the the sheriff who's representing the sheriff's office who believes in the program, he's one of the, the, the well-trained sheriffs who are really into it on their side, interrupts in total frustration. No, 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 no. By using stronger language. Um, you will be putting officers in a very difficult situation. Because when police officers fight against ugly, and you've got to understand, most cops got the job specifically to kick down doors. And if a client punches at an officer who is attempting to get him into a gurney on a 5150 assist, that's an automatic 148, Penal Code 148, resisting arrest. And the client will go to jail regardless if it's a 50, 5150. Officers don't like doing mental health. They'd rather be doing traffic stops on gang members. And they don't have to ask for the voluntary consents for them. Now, forgive me then um, for throwing you back, and this is the last one, for throwing you back in the county jail in the last note, where one of the several very dedicated for, um, forensic psychiatrists in Twin Towers who sent, sent us this case of a 30-year-old man with a history of more than 20 misdemeanor incarcerations, who gets occasionally added charged with felonies for assaulting uh, guards while in jail. He is consistently described um, uh, by correctional staff in their patient huddles as, quote, the worst patient on the floor, naked, flooding his cell, and banging on the door, close quote. After several months, however, this dedicated psychiatrist manages to develop a therapeutic alliance with the client who becomes adherent to medication, which actually controls his symptoms effectively. The forensic psychiatry, like psychiatric team, team um, in, in Twin Towers is able to persuade the county to conserve the patient inmate, and the inmate, to everyone's delight, agrees to this civil commitment, recognizing that he needs monitoring to take his medication consistently upon his release. Eagerly, the jail follows protocol and releases the inmates to become a patient in a county jail hospital using a simple 5150 mechanism for the hospital to then eventually locate in Miami or State Hospital for long-term conservatorship. But we later, however, 
the hospital, county hospital terminates the patient's conservatorship and follows up with a protest letter to the jail detailing three cases of jails inappropriately conserved patients, including this particular case, asserted contra the jail's longer durée clinical observations that the 30-year-old man's psychosis was, quote, street drug induced, close quote. Within less than six months, this same patient inmate was arrested three more times, requiring month-long intensive inpatient forensic treatment to restabilize. In fact, on, 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 on his last one, he was out charged for assaulting the guard again while in jail, and now faces longer-term incarceration as a felon um, rather than a psychotic misdemeanor to stand, to stand trial. So um, here again, you see the declining um, hospital beds uh, with, with, um, and, and uh, despite the rising um, emergency um, yeah, the hospital beds, stable hospital beds, despite the rising uh, California um, population. Um, and in conclusion, then, I want to apologize for, the, uh, for presenting depressing field notes about the system's level of subordination, <laughs> mental health priorities, and criminal justice repression. In the context of the failure of our, our safety net to deliver coordinated services, or even minimal temporary emergency psychiatric care services for people consistently, for people with serious mental illness. And um, I, I, um, because it be raised this in the introduction, the Board of Supervisors is, I guess, debating right now uh, during our grand rounds uh, whether they're going to invest $3 billion in a, in a mental health jail and that, uh, in a mental health program that's, a subor that's subordinated inside a county jail. And it's interesting to think about that because that, will, that would uh, literally set in cement and steel a formal subordination, not just for right now, but for several generations when we invest $3 billion in a well-intended um, you know, in well initiative like that, that uh, structurally we have so much evidence uh, creates contradictions. So um, I, I, I thank you for staying, and, um, and I admire those of you working on the front lines of this. specifically with the AOT, and I, I don't know if I ran through that, that photo too fast. Uh, the one thing AOT, there is one set of emerging, emerging uh, administered data, but the numbers are too small and there's too much missing data for it to be statistically significant. But the one thing that is measurably reduced with just the tendency in terms of the administered data is a reduced number of annualized hospital days in emergency care by, um, by, by, by uh, uh, people who qualify for AOT. But that's one specific program. It, it, obviously, the, the Office of Diversion and Reentry reaches many, 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 you know, much larger populations and, and community-based clinics reach much larger populations. Here, um, we are the largest in the country, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the highly visible population that we reach that, uh, that have usually, it's been kin 
uh, and working with the clinician to get some yeah. so, Let me just let's, let's play a game here. You, um, yeah. I can talk about it, don't worry. Um, so let's say that you are now placed in a position where you actually can do something as opposed to just monitor what's going on. What would be the first thing that you would change? I noticed, for example, recently DNH has been taken out of the prison and been replaced by DHS. So we have general positions rather than psychiatric positions. But what would be, knowing what you now know, well, not anymore. You know something about the craziness of those as we find out today. Why would you, where would you place your energy to change what we're doing if you had control of all those systems? Yeah, so I think that the, the, the priorities there, um, and, 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 and this is, um, and, and, you know, implementing them are, is the double from the detail, is one is, um, is, is, um, is figuring out institutionally from a systems delivery and organizations, you know, sociology perspective, how you can, how you can protect basically therapeutic and clinical priorities from being subordinated by the much better toned muscle of, of the criminal justice partnerships. Because um, we, we, we obviously, that, that's the only thing that exists. We have to work with criminal justice. Uh, but it can't be set up in a way where, where uh, we become subordinated to them. And, and, it, and it's very interesting, and it happens, and, and you can see it. How would you, how would you do that? What would you then have? So the, I mean, there, of something yeah, exactly. Gets... Yeah. So basically, the hot, the 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 the, the, the three billion dollars, and I mean, concretely, that three right. billion dollars that they're about to, um, you know, allocate or not allocate, that will have to be subordinated. It's a, it's a partnership, and it's in, in sheriff's department infrastructure. Um, so if that is instead uh, allocated to uh, um, in institutions that are under clinical and social services institutional purview, um, it's then you know there, there, there's a completely different ability for um, for the for the systems to be able to organize themselves in a more rational manner. And uh, so is that they, argument being put before the supervisors? Uh, yeah, that's and and that and it's actually successful. This is what I mean. L. A. is in a really exciting. This is uh, again. On. This, there's actually a reason to be super, super optimistic. It's an extraordinary moment, actually. That sort of the, the, the political stars are in order uh, for um, progressive changes to be instituted. And I think precisely it's clinicians that need to take leadership with that. Because you clinicians have the credibility with science, with not being ultra left coops like the social scientists, to be able to, to, to explain. You know, you know, show the mortality, um, the 1970s mortality. You know, say it, explain it rationally, and 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 and, and take leadership in a manner that um, that uh, changes that sort of uh, that that retones our, our our muscle bar. So that would be back into the department of mental health, or it would be something over above many different departments, and moving in a direction that is coordinated and cohesive. Yeah. So that 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 um, um yeah. I mean that, that I don't know that you, you know I, I I don't know that level of detail. When I came, they had just just done that um, the DHS the, the transfer from DMH to DHS and 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 um, you know that's a combination of of charismatic personalities fighting with each other and so forth in terms of that decision to take over for DHS to take over. And I don't know what actual difference it makes uh, between the two. Both of them. Are just as subordinated when they're operating in that setting, in some sense. So that whether it's DMH or DHS, um, is, it doesn't really matter in some sense. Um, and but uh, and it, it, the, the, it is, but there there is you know whatever. Uh, the, but so so it, so in that sense, it it just has to be. Um, it, 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 and, it, and it shouldn't just be DMH and, and DHS. It, it, it needs to be housing services. It, it needs to be allied services as well. It, it, it can't be because it's not going to be solved by um, it's not going to be solved by medication. You know, by, you know, arguably it has to be solved about that deeper integration and breaking the social the profound social isolation that um, makes actually in an interesting way people with 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 you know 
with, with, with serious mental illness, so extraordinarily appreciative, and, and it's kind of intuitive at first, but they're so extraordinarily appreciative at any moment when we're treated like a human being on some level. So it's it's just like asking, well, well, would you prefer a different medication than the one? I mean, actually treating them to listen to what they're saying, and they'll actually. I mean, they, they, so that in that sense, the therapeutic alliance is achievable uh, in those settings when it isn't under the supervision of a guard who's overhearing, who is saying, "Look, we have to do a set of distraction. Get out of my way. Everyone off the floor. We're going to you know, grab some and throw them out." And, and then counteracts uh, you know, the, 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 the fragile therapeutic alliance that's being built up and so forth. So those kinds of, I think that that level of interaction can be identified and, um, and then you know, it can be systematized in how the institutions are set up with autonomy and rules that can be enforced on, 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 uh, you know, on, on who's allowed to be present when the psychiatrist talks to a patient and so forth. Um, I mean, you, you have extraordinary examples across the world. I mean, in, 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 in uh, Turkey, for example, this, uh, the, the, a set of doctors just refused to talk to any patient in the presence of a police officer, or I mean, they have extraordinary levels of torture, and so forth. But, um, but they just throw them out of their offices. They control their clinics. And in our case, we, uh, you know, the, 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 the law enforcement just swarms through our clinics, and we actually call them and ask them to come in. Uh, for us uh, constantly, because we don't have the ability. We, you know, our, 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 our muscle tone isn't strong enough to, to do what that psychiatric nurse was describing in some sense. Um, sorry, I'm going to move on. That's okay. <laughs> so, so I think we need some more debates about that. Yeah, yeah. As you know, you've given us the, the, man, the, 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 the chaos and the tragedy. But I think as a university community, we need to be thinking about the solution to the chaos and the tragedy. A hundred percent, yeah. And, 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 that, and, 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 and it's actually, in that sense, it's clinicians on the front line and social service providers on the front line that are the ones that are capable of understanding that level, the, where the rubber hits the road, and then figuring so out. who's making that case to the supervisors? Just say that again. Is it one person or a bunch of people? There's, um, there's, uh, there's a, um, there's, I don't know, you, you, you know all that. Works. Clinicians who are affiliated with UCLA and, and other institutions in LA who are making this precise argument that vulnerability is a range of community-based you know, services for multiple needs, for multiple needs of the civilian you know, medical population that gets swept up in, you know, and gets stuck in terms of how it's appropriate. Um, and, and the solution is not another you know, a medical jail nor a new um, mega hospital, right? What we need is a range of services. Right, so you um, need some sort of facility to right. kind of care for the immediate. Yeah, but we also but need... You need something that extends out right. in the original concept of a community mental health program which never actually worked. Right, so, so that's the kind of argument that is literally being made right now um, to the board of supervisors. Um, and the supervisors, it looks like they all agree they're against the jail, but they haven't agreed on what the next step is. So that's where the debate is right now. So we'll leave it there, and maybe we should have a debate right here to see with some of these people to see what uh, what what we could do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.